Okay, so um, so the 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 lecture is organized as follow uh, um, for alpha bit, uh, roughly. I will present some um, approach to quantum gravity called group field theory. Um, and I will try to keep it uh, very um, like as simple as possible. Uh, in the second part, in which said, uh, I will present some recent results on holographic entanglement um, in the framework I, I will have introduced. Um, and so the second part will be a bit more technical. So we could split. Uh, we could take a break between these two parts. Okay, so I I want to start. Uh, um, okay, sorry, sorry. I want to start uh, um, by by um, uh, telling you a bit about uh, this um, connection between quantum gravity and quantum information. Uh, this is a field that is has been growing a lot uh, in the last few years uh, with many research directions, uh, um, uh, many people involved in the field, uh, with many um, many university uh, all around the world. So here I just uh, you know to 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 give you a. Um, an idea of what are the main questions that uh, um, that are addressed in this interconnection between gravity and quantum information. Here, uh, I put two of, of uh, um, one of the main um, um, initiatives that uh, uh, work at this interface of quantum gravity and quantum information. One is it from qubit. Um, that started uh, in the in, in the context of string theory, but then uh, I mean it, it touches many uh, many topics uh, also uh, non directly related to string theory. And the other one is the quantum information structure of space time. These are uh, I mean if you uh, have a look online, you will find many resources and many. Uh, uh, so if if you want to have a uh, flavor of what uh, what is going on in this uh, in this field so let me uh, okay um, let me give you a motivation uh, for why this connection between gravity quantum gravity and quantum information can be crucial for our understanding of space time um, so there are many results in classical and in semi-classical uh, physics uh, that suggests that uh, uh, space-time at the quantum level uh, is not continuum, but uh, is instead uh, composed of fundamental discrete entities. And uh, the main hint to, to this scenario is the black hole thermodynamics. Um, from Hawking and Bekestein, we know that um, black holes are um, provided by an entropy. And this entropy is telling us something fundamental about the discreteness of space time and the fact that um, space time, um, if, if we would have just uh, a scaling of the degrees of freedom, uh, as in, in local quantum field theory, then uh, we should expect some infinite um, entropy from black holes. The fact that the entropy is finite is telling us something uh, about the discreteness of space-time uh, at the quantum level. Um, so we can expect that uh, geometry, smooth space-time and geometry is replaced at the Planck scale by some more fundamental uh, picture, atomistic picture. And uh, um, so if we, um, in this perspective, uh, how does space-time look like? So on one hand, we have that space-time is a sort of uh, background independent quantum many body system. So a collection of atoms of space, if you wish. Background independent, uh, because we want to describe um, gravity, uh, space time. So the theory must be fundamentally uh, background independent. 
And on the other hand, uh, so if space-time has to emerge from the collective behavior of these quantum entities, so then we expect uh, quantum correlations and in particular entanglement to, to play um, a role in this uh, emergence of geometry. And so we have this, uh, um, this picture of space-time that emerges from this collective behavior of these fundamental quantum entities. And so you can um, already see why quantum information and condensed matter techniques are crucial to describe, to reconstruct geometry in this, uh, in this scenario. Um, now, uh, there are many results that uh, point to, to entanglement uh, as the glue of space-time, so of something uh, um, crucial for reconstructing geometry. Many results have been obtained in uh, um, what is called the anti-de-sitter conformal field theory correspondence, um, which is a duality between gravity in asymptotically anti-de-sitter space and the quantum field theory that lives on the boundary of the anti sitter space. So here you can see a, a, um, a picture of this idea. So you have gravity in the bulk and a conformal field theory on the boundary. Uh, can you see my pointer? Um, yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay, good. Um, so, uh, in, in, in this, uh, of course, um, in, in this uh, uh, setting, so we have many properties uh, of gravity that are reconstructed for, from the entanglement structure of the boundary theory. And uh, a prominent example of this is the Ryuta Kayanagi formula. The Ryuta Kayanagi formula relates the entanglement entropy for a certain region A on the boundary to the area of a surface in the bulk gravitational theory. And so here you see the connection between a geometric uh, gravitational quantity, the area, to some um, to entanglement in this non-gravitational boundary theory. Um, still in this, in this uh, context, uh, we have that uh, um, Entanglement uh, has been identified as uh, responsible for space-time connectivity. So there are works by Van Ramston, Kamaldasin, and Saskind, and many others that show that uh, by, by changing the entanglement between space-time regions, uh, um, you are uh, changing the, the, the connectivity between them and the distance uh, between them. These analogies have been promoted to the dynamic uh, of, uh, of the gravitational field and the Einstein's equations that, uh, have been shown to, to, to derive from some conformal field theory entanglement forced law. Um, and another example is the locality in the bulk uh, that is reconstructed from quantum error correction. So another um, um, another application of quantum information in, in quantum gravity. And uh, so the, the, the previous examples were in the anti sitter conformal field theory correspondence, but um, the connection between entanglement and space-time geometry and topology is something that has been explored in many other um, quantum gravity approaches. In fact, I will show you um, in, in detail, um, an example in group field theory. Here, I just want to mention that there are um, examples of spatial geometries that can arise from the entanglement of completely abstract quantum degrees of freedom. The different notions of distance have been reconstructed from entanglement, and again, that uh, you can uh, use entanglement to um, define the gluing uh, of quantum polyhedra to each other. Um, okay, so we have seen in this uh, so far this deep connection between entanglement and geometry and topology. 
Now there is, uh, uh, so gravity entanglement, there is a third uh, ingredient that, uh, um, uh, that seems to be um, intimately tied to, to both gravity and entanglement, that is holography. So holography is something that, uh, so is a concept that was um, um, developed uh, uh, by uh, starting by by um, what we know on black hole thermodynamics. So holography is the idea that um, some gravitational uh, theory can be encoded in uh, a non-gravitational uh, lower dimensional uh, theory. So um, in this context, uh, um, we have that Many results uh, are, uh, are pointing to some deep connection between uh, holography gravity and entanglement. So that gravity exhibits holographic feature is something that uh, um, it, it's true uh, from, from the fundamental uh, properties of, of the theory, like the fact that the, the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. Um, so the, the the results of diffeomorphism invariants. Um, then, as I said, we have black hole thermodynamics and the fact that the black hole entropy scales with the area uh, of the black hole, not with the volume. The ADS-CFT correspondence I mentioned, um, local holography, which is, um, which is a research direction that uh, looks at the corner symmetry charges as uh, a tool for encoding bulk quantum geometry. And so to, to close the circle, we then have that uh, independently of gravity, there are um, many uh, condensed matter and quantum information systems uh, whose entanglement uh, um, follows um, exhibits uh, holographic behavior. And so a natural question in, in, this, uh, in this scenario is, uh, uh, is there something uh, uh, at the fundamental level that is relating uh, gravity, holography, and entanglement? What, what can we learn about quantum gravity by, by exploring this, um, this interconnection? Now, I, I will... Uh, uh, I will talk about uh, um, a particular approach of quantum gravity, group field theory, in which this uh, scenario is explicitly uh, realized. In particular, uh, what is realized is the idea that is suggested by, by the things I, I, I mentioned so far, that quantum space-time is, uh, uh, in some sense, a geometric representation of entanglement. And in group field theory, we will see that space-time is indeed a collection of what can be uh, understood as atoms of space, so it's effectively a quantum many-body system, and the connectivity of space-time is given by the entanglement structure of the space quanta. So, here is uh, a representation of this idea so that you start with an atom of space and then by glue, by entangling uh, this quanta, you can reconstruct um, geometries. Um, so if we expect that uh, uh, the, the entanglement structure of this space quanta um, is responsible for the physical properties of the uh, emerging quantum space-time, then uh, a natural question in, in this um, framework I, I presented uh, is how uh, an holographic behavior is determined by, by entanglement. So how the entanglement affects the flow of information from the back to the boundary. Can, can we um, investigate uh, this interconnection between holography and entanglement in this context uh, using quantum information. So here is the, the outline of, um, of the seminar. So I will start by, by presenting Lufi theory, the foundations of this approach. 
And then I will go a bit more in detail and talk about how geometry is reconstructed from entanglement in, in this framework. Um, I, uh, I will then move to a quantum information tool that uh, we, we will use uh, later on. Uh, it's called Tensor Networks. Uh, is quantum information tool that uh, uh, has the, the remarkable property of encoding entanglement in the geometry of a network. Um, then I will, uh, so these are the, let's say the background, um, the background for, for um, our program. And then uh, in the last two points, I will go uh, into uh, some results that have been obtained in recent years to show you uh, an example of how can we apply these tools to, to, to answer some of the questions I, I presented before. So I will talk about quantum geometries characterized from this quantum information perspective, and then uh, investigation of uh, holography and entanglement. Okay, so let's start with the group field theory um, framework. So uh, the group field theory approach to quantum gravity um, is intended as a quantum field theory, not on space-time, but of space-time. And we will see what that means. Uh, so in particular, um, we will look at these three basic ingredients, which is a field theory formalism, a group structure. So a group field theory is a theory defined on a group manifold. And uh, finally, the combinatorial non-locality of the interactions in group field theory. So now, uh, so why a field theory uh, formalism? Well, quantum field theory is a, a field theory actually because uh, so it's something that we 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 use in physics to describe uh, um, physics from the microscopic to the uh, mesoscopic and macroscopic scales uh, in high energy particle physics, um, but general relativity itself is a classical uh, field theory. So uh, it's very natural that uh, uh, in looking for a theory of quantum gravity, we, um, we rely on a field theory formalism. But the crucial point about uh, gravity is that uh, we require background independence. So we want a theory that is completely independent on any background structure because it's a theory of space-time itself. This means that uh, we cannot define the field theory on uh, background space-time. We need to define the field theory of some auxiliary space. Auxiliary space, which has to be, uh, as I said, non-dynamical. And so what we can, um, what can we um, identify as auxiliary space? Uh, well, Oh, I see there is a um, hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you apply field theory, can't it gives uh, means divergence? Uh, means it's a non renormalization theory, huh? quantum gravity. Well, um, so far I'm still uh, the defining the the theory, so it depends what you mean. The um, I mean I can construct a field theory with a cutoff and have a renormalizable theory. Uh, and you, you will see that there is an intrinsic cutoff in the group field theory approach. So uh, now I, I'm completely general. I still have to, to present an action, a partition function, uh, and so on. Oh, this is OK, this is just an, um, uh, to give you a motivation for, um, for the construction. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, there must be a field theory on some auxiliary space uh, and the auxiliary non-dynamical structure that we can identify, and we will see uh, how it uh, uh, emerges, uh, is the symmetry group of the theory. And in particular, uh, the symmetry group, so we look at the Lorentz group or its rotation subgroup group, and we indeed see that um, one of the... Um, 
main group field theory models for quantum gravity is the rotation SU2 group. And so in d-dimensional gravity, we are going to see that the field is a field defined on some copies of a Lie group to uh, complex or real numbers according to, to, to the group field theory model we want to construct. So the group structure, as I said, is a field theory defined on a group manifold. Um, now I want to give you an intuition of why uh, we might want um, a group uh, like SU2, the rotation group, to define our field theory. So let's consider, um, as an example, a quantum tetrahedron. So let's start, uh, um, let's first look at the classical uh, level, okay? So if I have a tetrahedron, how can I describe the geometry? So I can describe the geometry by giving you four vectors, uh, each vector normal to a face of the tetrahedron and with length such that uh, is equal to the area of the corresponding face. Now, if you give me four vectors, uh, mm, these four vectors, uh, I, I know that they uh, describe a tetrahedron if they satisfy what is called the closure condition. Okay, so because four independent vectors might not be dual to the faces of a tetrahedron that close up. Um, but if we add these conditions that the sum is equal to zero, then we indeed um, have four vectors describing the full uh, geometry of a tetrahedron. And you can understand this condition also from uh, um, from the fact that uh, um, it um, ensures that uh, uh, the description is invariant under rotations, because if I apply a rotation, the same rotation to all four vectors, uh, then uh, um, the sum is invariant. So I can consider, so these are, are just um, elements of the rotation uh, algebra, SO2. Uh, so I have a description of the geometry for the classical tetrahedron. I, if I want to quantize the phase space of classical geometries of the tetrahedron, oh, oh yeah, is there another question? So when you write means this sum is zero then how can it be four independent means they will be dependent on each other now you can write one of them means dependent on other suppose you can write now l1 as a minus of l2 minus l3 minus l4 because all the yeah yeah exactly zero. exactly they are not independent this is why they can describe uh, properly the geometry of a tetrahedron so the, the actual number of degrees of freedom is less than the ones I just need to describe. Oh, space time, oh, space time is two dimension now. Oh, now I'm talking about 3D space. Oh, okay. 3D space, yeah. So I have this. Uh, so now uh, this is really just to 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 have a, um, an idea of why the the SU two group um, where the SU two group uh, comes from. So now I'm really just focusing on this tetrahedron without uh, uh, considering it embedded in space time. Uh, so just the tetrahedron itself. So once I quantize the phase space of the classical geometry of the, of the tetrahedron, then, uh, um, so what we have, the, the four vectors, uh, these are just, uh, uh, so I promote these two operators, and these are just uh, the, the usual angular momentum operators in quantum mechanics. And so I can uh, diagonalize uh, the total angular momentum and one of the, 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 the angular momentum along one of the direction, let's say LZ, and so we have the, the spin quantum numbers and the magnetic numbers, and these are just a uh, representation space for SU2. So now what I have is, uh, uh, so here I, I depicted not just the tetrahedron, but also the dual representation in terms of a vertex. And now uh, at the quantum level, um, the geometric information is encoded 
in these spins, which are attached to the links of the vertex. Um, and uh, you can, so we started from, from vectors so whose uh, length was proportional to the area of the corresponding surface. Now at the quantum level, um, you can, um, once you, you define an area operator, you can um, verify that these are indeed the agent related to the agent values of the area operators. But what about the closer condition? So, so uh, as we said, so we have four vectors, they are not independent and to, to properly describe a tetrahedron, they need to sum to zero. Now, so to understand what, what, what um, the disclosure condition implies, uh, we need to, to consider um, representation theory. So what the closure condition is telling us uh, at the level of the spins is that uh, the spins must recouple in a um, rotation invariant way. Now, uh, consider what happens in, uh, uh, in the case of three spins. Mm -hmm. So if we have three spins, uh, then um, the amplitude, the corresponding amplitude is just given by the Klebs gordon coefficients. Now, what we have here is instead the recoupling of four spins. And differently from the three spin case uh, where the Klebs gordon coefficient is unique, uh, here we have an additional uh, um, degree of freedom that arises uh, when we want to recouple these four spins in a SU2 invariant way. In fact, now, uh, instead of this the clips gordon coefficient, we have a tensor. So if we look at the SU2 invariant quantities, uh, we have an SU2 invariant tensor uh, with an additional quantum number that is called intertwiner. So basically what, 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 what happens at the quantum level is that in addition to these four spins and the related magnetic numbers, I have an additional uh, quantum number that takes into account the fact that these four spins indeed the recouples and that they describe the quantum geometry of the tetrahedron. So uh, we will use a lot this dual representation um, of the tetrahedron in which we have just a vertex with some edges um, and these edges are colored with some quantum numbers and this structure is called spin network vertex. So back to the, um, to the original uh, picture. So we started from the algebraic structure, no? Okay, so we started with the four uh, vectors, then we quantize them and we obtain these angular momentum operators. And we apply the closure condition and so that we have uh, indeed four spins. These are um, the corresponding representation spaces and an additional quantum number. And this is the, corresponding Hilbert space that takes into account um, this invariant recoupling. But um, we can just move from the algebra to the group, and this is just a, a usual Fourier transform. And so instead of working at the level of the SU2 algebra, we work at the level of the SU2 group. So, um, the Hilbert space for the single tetrahedron that in the spin representation was given by these four uh, representation spaces, one for each edge, and this additional intertwiner Hilbert space on the node. Now what we have is instead an element of the group on each edge. And what about the closer condition? Yeah, well, uh, through the Fourier transform, you can just check that the equivalent of summing these operators to zero is to require that uh, if we apply an SU2 rotation, the same SU2 rotation to all um, group elements uh, in, a, in a consistent way, the associated wave function uh, is left invariant. So we have a quantum tetrahedron here. You see the wave function in the spin representation uh, basis. 
When we move to the group basis, we have wave functions that satisfies this condition. So now the vector G is the collection of the four uh, group elements. If I apply the same rotation H to all of them, the wave function is left invariant. So here you can have an idea of why with uh, a group uh, SU2 variables, I can describe quantum geometry. Here uh, we are just at the level of the tetrahedron. But uh, this was to, to, yeah, to give you a, a, um, an idea of where this group manifold comes from. No? So in group field theory, we have a field that is indeed defined on four copies of the group. And the field itself satisfies this closure condition. And um, so we define a Fox space for this field theory. And the Fox space is constructed as usual by um, consider the, the tensor product of the single tetrahedron Hilbert spaces, symmetrizing, and then summing over all possible numbers of tetrahedra, if you want. And uh, the crucial point is that the excitation of this field is then to be understood as a quantum of space, so as a single tetrahedron. And so a generic n-particle state, where particle here is, as I said, to be understood as this quantum uh, it's a building block of space, n-particle states uh, could be um, generically associated to a collection of n tetrahedra. So in group field theory, um, so in group field theory, we have this POC structure. Uh, which, uh, I want to means as you might be, I have missed how you have obtained the Hamiltonian for the tetrahedra. Sorry, how I have obtained? You have pre in previous slide, yeah, previous slide. This L square by G4 by G means how you have obtained this? Might oh. be I have missed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, is uh, because I have the four copies of the group for the four edges. But the fact that I require gauge invariance and denote it, this means that I have this partition for an additional element of the group. So this is taking into account this condition here that says that the four elements are not independent. They are actually related by invariant under an SU2 rotation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thanks for the questions. So that, that, that they're very good to, to clarify some points. I, I may go too quickly to that. Um, okay, so in, in group field theory, uh, we have the so we have this quantum um, of space, this particle, and then uh, we we can um, consider a collection of them. And as we are going to see in, in detail. Uh, we can entangle them to reconstruct um, a, a quantum geom quantum discrete geometry. Of course, the continuum case is obtained in the limit of infinite number of tetrahedra. Um, but the, 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 the important point is that we reconstruct geometries from the gluing of these building blocks of space. Now, uh, um, as I showed before, um, it's usually um, it, it's common to use the dual representation in which the single tetrahedron is given by a vertex. And in this representation, we obtain what is called the spin network graph, which is the graph dual to the simplicial complex obtained from the gluing of the, the individual tetrahedra. And uh, this spin network graph uh, so is now encoding the geometry of these tetrahedra glued to each other and is decorated by spins, which, as I said, encode the area, quantum numbers, and uh, intertwiners that instead, if you, um, if you construct a volume operator, uh, you can see that these intertwinants are related to volume uh, agent values. So the intertwiner is, um, has information about the volume of this uh, building block, and the spins 
have information on the area of the surface dual to the edge. So this is an important point, I hope uh, it's clear. Um, let me stress for those of you uh, that are familiar with loop quantum gravity, um, that so if you canonically quantize general relativity, then um, you can see that uh, um, you indeed have this uh, spin network uh, graph and the group variables uh, associated to, to the edges uh, are given by the um, exponentiation of the astecker barbero connection along the edge. So they are indeed um, encoding curvature and, um, and uh, in the dual uh, representation, information about the area of the surface dual to the edge. Uh, so again, we just have this uh, holonomy of the connection, and then we go to the dual representation and we obtain these spins and intertwiners. Uh, okay. Okay, now let's move to the, uh, to the third uh, ingredient for group field theory, uh, and is the combinatorial non-locality of the interactions. So, so far, I only introduced you the kinematic of group field theory. So I mentioned that we can reconstruct uh, spatial geometries by gluing um, uh, this quantum tetrahedra to each other. Now, what about the dynamics, the, the histories, if you want, of these uh, spatial geometries? Now, to understand uh, what, what, how does that work, let me give you an example for matrix models for 2D quantum gravity, uh, something you may have seen. In, in. Um, so in matrix model, uh, the fundamental element is a, a matrix that uh, you can interpret as dual to some edge. And you can write uh, an action for it. And what you can see is that the interaction vertices are non-local in the sense that I have non-local pairing of the indices in the interaction term. And this non-local pairing of the indices is what um, gives me uh, this vertices dual to the triangulation. And so once I have a partition function for this theory and I, I consider uh, perturbative expansion over all possible 2D complexes. Uh, now I indeed um, uh, recover a simplicial path integral for 2D gravity, in this case with a cosmological context uh, um, constant. And this is discretized on the associated simplicial complex. So in this case, my simplicial complex um, arises from um, this interaction of um, matrices dual to the edges. And this non-local pairing is what gives rise to uh, this triangulation. In group field theory, something very similar uh, is going on. Um, let me give you an example in 3D quantum gravity because so now what uh, we call, I mean, before we saw the quantum tetrahedron, now let's move one dimension lower to, to facilitate the, the, the illustration. So now let's consider as a fundamental building block a triangle, not a tetrahedron. So let's move to 3D quantum gravity. So now what we want to reconstruct at the kinematic level are just 2D surfaces. And these are go, the, given by the gluing of triangles. And here is the corresponding graph. And this non-local pairing in the action is what allows four triangles to um, build up to form a tetrahedron. So here we have the interaction term. And uh, I can write a partition function for this theory and um, have a perturbation in, uh, um, in expansion in the number of graphs. Um, and so now what, what results from, from the interactions of these 
is a higher dimensional simplicial complex. And here you can see the uh, dual representation in which here we have the interaction vertex. Here is the spin network graph. And so this can be understood as a history for that spin network. Okay, so we have seen the, the foundations for group field theory. Now let's, uh, so I, I already mentioned that geometries arise from gluing uh, uh, these building blocks of space, but let's look at why they, they indeed derive from entanglement. Uh, so let me recap, we, we have a, a Hilbert space for a single quantum tetrahedron. We reconstruct from, from it uh, a Fox space for the tetrahedron. And this space uh, is associated to, uh, I mean, in this Fox space, we can have generic many body wave function associated to generic number of building blocks. Um, how entanglement uh, is responsible for the gluing? So what does that mean to, to glue uh, two tetrahedra, for example, together? Now, um, so we have, I mentioned, we have the, the group variables. So, so here is the representation um, of two vertices of two tetrahedra. And here you have the, the, the four edges with the associated group variables. So if, uh, so here is, I have the holonomy of the connection uh, the group, um, along this edge and to proper glue this edge to this one, which means to glue the two triangles uh, uh, dual to the faces, uh, the corresponding faces of this tetrahedra. Now, uh, to glue them in a consistent way, we want the resulting uh, um, holonomy to be given by the product of the first element uh, here, G4, and the second element, Q4 for the other edge. And uh, so gluing uh, um, at the group level uh, is just an average uh, over all possible um, uh, rotation that you want to, that you apply simultaneously. Um, and when you move to the spin representation, what you see is that uh, this gluing uh, it just corresponds to impose maximally and maximal entanglement between the spins associated to these edges. Indeed, if usually for four spins, we have an intertwiner recoupling them, here to recouple in an invariant way these two edges, what I need is a bivalent intertwiner. So an intertwiner that um, in the spin representation is actually a singlet state, so a maximally entangled state. Uh, let me close the be noisy. Um, okay, so um, so if we start from a many body wave function in our Fox space for an arbitrary connection of tetrahedra, then to glue them, uh, we just need to impose maximal entanglement between the corresponding edges. And so what we do is to project this many body wave function for the um, tetrahedra project to a maximally entangled state, a singlet state that's usually called link state. And in this way, instead of a, a bunch of open uh, disconnected tetrahedra, we have a, a quantum geometries with tetrahedra glued to each other. And in the dual representation, we have a connected uh, graph. Okay, so uh, I think before the break, we, we can go through this uh, last uh, piece of background, let's say, uh, and introduce you to tensor networks. So tensor networks uh, are um, a very powerful tool in quantum information and in condensed matter physics because they can um, they are very efficient in manipulating entanglement for quantum many body systems and they are, are largely used uh, in quantum gravity especially in the ads cft correspondence but uh, also as uh, we will see in group field theory so what is a tensor network 
A tensor network is just um, a, a network, a set of tensors that are contracted according to a, a certain pattern. So you can, um, in a graphical representation, a tensor is just a node, uh, a node with a number of uh, um, edges, one edge for each uh, tensor index. And uh, uh, so this index uh, label a basis in a corresponding Hilbert space. So the tensor can be just understood as a state in some uh, tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Um, and so a contraction um, of indices uh, is graphically a gluing of nodes. And as I said, um, they are very efficient in simulating uh, many body physics. Uh, and the, the, um, the key point of tensor network is that uh, they encode entanglement in, a, uh, in the geometry of a network. So you already see the, the analogy with the uh, um, the previous case. Now we will look at a very um, specific class of tensor networks, which are called uh, projected entangled pair states. Uh, these are um, constructed from considering uh, uh, pairs of maximally entangled uh, particles. Here are these lines uh, with two dots. And uh, in correspondence to certain node, they are projected. Um, in the same state. And so a tensor network uh, uh, with um, a PEPS, it's called PEPS, is just a collection of these maximally entangled pairs projected together. Um, and the, the, the important point here is that the entanglement entropy of this network is uh, completely encoded by the geometry in the sense that uh, anytime we, we cut a link in this graph, we are actually considering a contribution to the entropy equal to the logarithm of the dimension of the link. Because as I said, these uh, links are maximally entangled pairs. So the entanglement entropy content uh, is the logarithm of the dimension of the associated Hilbert space. And so here you see an example in which these subsystems A and B have the same size, but the entanglement entropy is different because it's different the connectivity with the rest of the graph. Here, uh, the entanglement entropy of A corresponds to cut two links, here just one link. Um, and the last, uh, the last point is that uh, so these uh, on projected entangled per states, uh, you can actually add some um, additional degree of freedom uh, on the node. And these additional degrees of freedom is introduced just by, um, by changing the tensors, by en enlarging the hyperspace of the corresponding tensors. And this additional degree of freedom is usually called the physical index, while the degree of freedom that are glued together and form the geometry of the network are called the auxiliary indices. And we will see that uh, uh, this structure will appear uh, again in group field theory. Okay, yeah, question? Uh, by maximally entangled, in suppose I am a perturbating a system in somewhere else space, it will show a effect there in uh, means uh, some other space time means some other space time means a very large distance from that point because they are maximally entangled. Oh, very good. Yeah, the, there is indeed um, there are indeed many many ways in which you can define a distance uh, um, through entanglement. Uh, now, the, the, the crucial point is that um, since uh, the gluing is given by entanglement, entanglement is a way to establish uh, who is next to whom. So in this case, uh, is a, is a um, notion is a relationship uh, between two uh, sites. Uh, and the maximal entanglement uh, means that that sites are directly related to each other. Now, so if they, they are neighboring entangled, means not uh, means with every point of the space time. 
Well, sorry, say again. I'm saying at a single site there means entangle neighbor with uh, with neighboring node or neighboring vertex. I am saying not with every space time point. So they are entangled, no, not with every space time. They are entangled only to the to the the points that are connected by a link to okay. that site. But keep in mind that there is no space space time here yet. So space time is an emergent uh, notion and, and space time uh, is, is something that we recover at the continuum classical limit. Here we are still, if you want, at the pre-geometric level. So here we are really building up relationship among the space quanta to reconstruct a notion of uh, geometry, distance, and so on. As but this mind, level, there is no metric yet to define a distance. This is what I'm saying. And, and, and another thing is, means if I am getting a, means a, a wave function for the system here in terms of simplices, and it depends on number of nodes at this end point. So when I'm obtaining entanglement entropy, it will contain everything. Means, uh, have means uh, entanglement entropy of the system. If I want the entanglement entanglement entropy of the sus subsystem what i have to do means because at a different location entanglement entropy will be different because of the different number of nodes yeah so it means i want a means entanglement entropy of the suppose a subsystem Sub sub system is part of that system how means how will i obtain that sorry how i obtain what uh, means entanglement entropy i am talking about means if i obtain the wave function of a system so entanglement the entanglement entropy of the subsystem means it depend depend on different means locations because different nodes have different entanglement entropy. J just as you are saying, means upper part yeah. has different entanglement entropy, lower part has different entanglement entropy. Yeah, yeah. In fact, no, yeah, yeah. But the wave function I am obtaining is the wave function of the system, not of the subsystem. Well, this is the the you consider the entanglement entropy of the reduced system. In fact, I, I can have here a wave function for the whole graph, and then if I want the entanglement entropy of B, I trace out the rest and I obtain a contribution oh. only from one link. Oh, means you will do partial. Uh, huh? in, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, of course, this is tricky in the com complete theory of quantum gravity because of just the, the space does not factorize in general, but at the level of tensor networks, this is very clear because the Hilbert space factorizes. So I trace out and I have an entanglement entropy given by extensive in the number of links that I cut. Okay, uh, so I think this is a good point for, for a break, uh, if you want, because there's a, a uh, in the middle of the, the seminar. So far, we have seen so far the um, foundations of group field theory. Uh, we have seen that uh, in group field theory, gluing uh, uh, pieces of space uh, um, means entangling uh, the degrees of freedom uh, attached to them. And we introduced the tensor networks, which are uh, a condensed matter uh, quantum information tool. Um, and, uh, um, and now we are going to see that uh, indeed we can uh, characterize uh, group field theory geometries from a quantum information uh, perspective. Uh, by by building up a dictionary between uh, spin networks in group field theory and tensor networks. Okay, so um, so uh, we uh, we have seen that uh, in the Fox space uh, we can have uh, many body wave functions uh, associated to a generic number of atoms of space, quantum tetrahedra, um, and that we can uh, glue them to each other by projecting the uh, edge degrees of freedom into maximally entangled states. So here we have the link state, 
the maximally entangled state. And here is our wave function that factorizes uh, uh, per vertex. This is a, um, so we can start, we can make a choice on this wave function. This is not, of course, the uh, most generic one because in the Fox space, you can have a wave function with arbitrary uh, entanglement structure, but we make, here a specific choice of considering a wave function which factorizes per vertex, and then we perform the gluing. And once we do that, we see that in the spin network basis, what we get is exactly a tensor network, in particular a project entangled per states. And so if you decompose through the uh, Fourier transform and you move to the spin basis, uh, then you see that uh, uh, you have the, the wave function one for X vertex, and then you have this delta, which are identify indices on the different uh, edges. And so we have exactly the project entangled per state uh, structure. Now let's look at the tensor um, more in detail. I mentioned before that the indices responsible for the gluing are usually called auxiliary indices in the uh, tensor network framework. Here, the auxiliary indices are indeed the ones on the edges, so the magnetic numbers associated to, to the edges. The intertwiner, uh, which contains the volume uh, information of the space quanta is an additional quantum number on this uh, network and thus plays the role of physical index. And the spins are what is called in tensor network bond dimension because they set the dimension of the magnetic index um, and can run from uh, minus j to j. So um, these spins are set in the dimension for the magnetic numbers. Now, these are very particular tensor network uh, states. Um, this is why I, I stress the generalized tensor networks uh, for many reasons. Um, so first of all, in tensor networks, the dimension of the indices is usually fixed. Here instead, the dimension of the indices uh, um, is a dynamical variable. Um, so we can have dynamical and potentially infinite bond dimensions. We also have, due to the gauge symmetry of the construction, the intertwiner is not independent. The intertwiner that is a physical index here is not independent from the other indices because the intertwiner arises from the recoupling of the spins, as I showed before. So there is a, a connection between the dimension of the spins and the dimension of the intertwiner. But more crucially, in this uh, quantum gravity setting, uh, the graph is not fixed. Uh, so we have here quanta of space that interact with each other, glue to each other to form geometries, and then they can um, evolve, build up space time. So the, the structure of the network is dynamical. The combinatorial structure can change. You can create, annihilate nodes. Uh, and we are in a second quantized picture, which is also something not uh, that you don't see in usual tensor networks. Um, so in particular means that uh, um, these vertices are undistinguishable as we want because uh, as a stress, we are in a background independent setting. So um, our quanta of space uh, um, are undistinguishable to each other. So how can we recover distinguishability of them to, to actually make computation to, to, to identify a region with respect to others and so on? Well, you can uh, recover this uh, at an effective level in a relational way, meaning that you introduce an additional field, um, usually a massless scalar field, uh, which is minimally coupled to your um, theory, and that uh, you can use as a, uh, as a clocker, as a road, as a, a reference, effective reference frame. Um, okay, so. 
um, we have that spin networks can be uh, at, at least uh, this special class of spin networks uh, constructed by gluing uh, wave functions that factorize per vertex. Uh, they are indeed uh, tensor network, uh, and uh, we are going to focus now on a particular class of uh, um, spin network states, which is called random tensor networks. So uh, in this setting, uh, the wave functions associated to the individual vertices are randomized. How? Just uh, by starting with some uh, reference state, uh, apply a unitary operator and uh, um, average on them. Um, and this is a very, very powerful technique in uh, um, tensor networks because it allows to map the computation of entropies to the evaluation of the free energy of a classical easing model defined on the graph itself. And I'm going to, to uh, illustrate this um, because it's a very uh, important point, is extremely useful to, to, to compute things, and uh, is the, the starting point of all the following analysis on holographic entanglement in group field theory. So, um, so first, uh, we are going to focus uh, on uh, the Rennie, second order Rennie entropy. The second order Rennie entropy is defined as the logarithm of the trace of rho squared. So it's a function of the purity of the state. Now, why the Rennie entropy? Well, it is much easier uh, to compute that the usual von Neumann entropy can be defined for a, a generic number of copies. And, uh, um, and in the limit of the number of copies that goes to one, you can recover the von Neumann entropy. So uh, the Rennie entropy is something that, that is usually um, computed in this setting, and then the von Neumann entropy is recovered in this uh, analytic continuation. And uh, um, how it is computed? So usually uh, what is uh, applied is the so-called replica trick. So a replica trick is a way to compute the trace of uh, the square of a matrix, and it consists of uh, considering two copies. Uh, so if I want the trace of uh, the, the density matrix reduced to some region uh, P here, I can instead consider two copies of the um, wall uh, density matrix, of the complete density matrix, and then apply a swapping operator, an operator that swaps the two copies only in a subsystem P. So you can uh, do the computation. It's, uh, it's straightforward to check that indeed this procedure gives you back the trace of rho squared. Um, so the replica trick uh, applied to the Rennie entropy is has this uh, quantity. And the denominator is just um, a normalization uh, factor. And uh, the, the, the other key point is that in the limit in which the spins attached to your network are very large, then, uh, and you have a random tensor network, then you can take the average, uh, I mean, you can suppress the fluctuations around uh, instead of the, the main value of the word quantity, just the logarithm of the average uh, on these two zeta one, zeta zero independently. So how does the, um, the, easing, spin, the easing model uh, arises in this context? Um, okay, this might be a bit involved, but uh, it's just to, to, to give you an idea of how it works. So uh, here is the uh, zeta one and zeta zero quantities uh, for our case uh, in which we have this wave function constructed by gluing uh, um, individual uh, um, separated vertices. We have to take two copies uh, so we consider two copies of the link states, uh, two copies uh, on the vertex states, uh, and then uh, 
for the replica trick, we have this swapping operator. Now here we are looking at a generic region. Uh, a is a region on in for the boundary spins, the boundary degrees of freedom. Omega is for the region of the bulk, so the intertwiner degrees of freedom. And what you can see when you perform this average is that uh, it is uh, the partition function, uh, it, sorry, it is indeed equal to the partition function of an easing model in which you have this easing action that depends on spins which are attached to the nodes of your network. And uh, uh, so in this action, you indeed have contributions from the link of your network. So you see that when uh, um, uh, this contribution disappear when the spins are aligned, the easing spins are aligned to each other. And uh, so this is a contribution that comes from the interaction of nearest neighbor spins. And then we have uh, some contribution from the boundary degrees of freedom. Here you can insert some boundary um, fields, uh, boundary indices that uh, controls which region of the boundary you are looking at, and the same for the bulk fields. So here we have an additional contribution from the boundary edges, and here we have a contribution from the uh, bulk uh, degrees of freedom. And uh, so what you can show is that uh, in the case in which the in the spins are large, uh, this, uh, the computation of the Irani entropy is indeed equal to the energy cost of flipping down uh, these fields uh, in the region you are interested in. Uh, so we are going to apply this technique um, for the study of the second order Irani entropy for regions of space, uh, quantum space in group field theory. Oh, uh, yeah, question? So this spin correspond to what? Means uh, the normal to the tetrahedral faces? No, no, these spins are completely are just a mathematical tool. These easing spins are just uh, um, something that arises uh, uh, when we want to compute the Rennie entropy for regions of space, uh, for regions of our graph. They don't have a, a, um, an interpretation at the physical level. This is a purely um, mathematical tool for the computation of the entropy. So the interesting thing is that if I want the entanglement entropy of, let's say, this region of the graph, then I, I have to flip down these red boundary fields. Um, and if I want to consider also these two nodes, uh, I need to, to flip down also the, uh, this red, the, the green bulk uh, spins, and then I compute the energy cost of this flipping. So uh, this uh, is just uh, um, something that arises from the random character of my tensors and the fact that I'm looking at the second order any entropy. There is no uh, interpretation at the geometric level of these easing spins. But the, 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 the remarkable fact is that your easing model lives on the graph you started from. So the interaction between the easing spins is indeed interaction for nearest neighborhoods on your graph. Okay, so, um, okay, so now we have all the, 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 um, the ingredients to move to to the um, investigation of holographic entanglement. So let me just recap that uh, we have seen uh, um, a quantum gravity language, the one of group field theory uh, that can be characterized uh, from a quantum information perspective, in particular spin networks for quantum geometries can be regarded as uh, patterns of entanglement among space quanta and they uh, corresponds to tensor networks. And now uh, in the remaining part of, of, of this lecture, I will um, talk about some recent works on um, 
the boundary entropy uh, for these graphs that exhibit holographic behavior and the relation between bulk and boundary um, uh, degrees of freedom. And we will see in which case uh, these two uh, have a holographic uh, relation. Um, okay, so if we want to look at the uh, entropy in the boundary, we apply the same technique I, I introduced before. But now we just uh, um, we just need to consider the um, the boundary. So we just look at a certain region A of the boundary. So we start from the density matrix for the whole graph. We want to trace out the complementary of A and compute the Rennie entropy for this region. And by applying this uh, random tensor network technique, we find that this entropy is indeed equal to um, the uh, partition function for an easing model that lives on the graph. Uh, and the, we need to compute the energy cost of flipping down these boundary fields in this um, region A. And in this case, um, we want to see how the boundary entropy depends on the entanglement of the bulk degrees of freedom. So we start from a wave function with, um, that factorizes per vertex. So we apply, uh, we entangle the links to glue them to each other. And then we insert an additional input state for the bulk degrees of freedom. And so we want we uh, we ask how this uh, entanglement entropy on the boundary depends on the entanglement uh, for the bulk. Um, so here is a sketch of what's going on with the easing model. So our um, uh, initial conditions are these boundary fields flip down in region A, and then your easing the model will. Uh, try to minimize the energy by, um, uh, so we have a region in which all the spins are flipped down as an effect of this boundary region A, while in the rest of the graph, uh, the spins will align to each other and will be up due to the, the uh, because they are in the, 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 this behavior is induced by this complementary boundary region where the spins are up. And so we have uh, um, a surface in the bulk, uh, which is the domain sets the, the, the domain wall for this, um, uh, for this interaction of the easing spins. And uh, what we can see is that uh, um, the boundary entropy is given in the case in which the um, uh, entanglement of the bulk degrees of freedom is small, we just recover an area law for the boundary entropy. So the boundary entropy is given by the area of a surface that minimizes it and the bulk uh, degrees of freedom are just a small correction to the area law. So this is uh, um, exactly what happens in holography in a DSFT with the Ryutakayanagi formula, where we have the uh, entanglement entropy for the boundary given by the area of a certain surface in the bulk. Now here, the um, area um, is uh, emerges uh, exactly before because uh, um, so I, 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 in the first part of the seminar, we have seen that the edges on the links of the network uh, encode area degrees of freedom and the entanglement entropy is given by cutting these links. So um, here the contribution to the entropy is the one that I obtain when I cut the link and the dimension of the link is proportional to the area of the surface dual to the link themselves. So this is why this area law arises in this case. Um, the situation is different if when we increase 
the um, entanglement entropy of the intertwiner of the bulk degrees of freedom. And in this case, we have a transition from an area law to an area and a volume law, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the entropy is given by um, the, the minimum of a contribution that has uh, inside both the area and the volume. Okay, so let's uh, consider um, a different case, a case in which the intertwiner, the bulk degrees of freedom are entangled only in a certain region. So here is an example of uh, a graph geometry. And uh, uh, so we want to look at the uh, boundary entropy for a certain region on the boundary A but with bulk degrees of freedom that are entangled only in a sub-region of the graph, in particular in this yellow region here. And what we get is that, uh, um, so again, uh, the entanglement entropy follows some area and volume law, but the interesting part is that uh, when a large entanglement is present in this region that we can remove uh, the degeneracy of this surface. So in this case here are depicted two surfaces that uh, with, in the case in which the back degrees of freedom are not entangled, they give exactly the same contribution to the entropy. But as you see, once you, you, um, you insert correlations among the intertwiners, then the surface is forced to move to, to minimize the volume contribution. And um, in, by increasing further the dimension of the correlated bulk degrees of freedom, we can arrive at the emergence of a sort of black hole region in the sense that uh, once these uh, degrees of freedom are highly entangled to each other and uh, with high dimensions, then the surface that gives you the entropy is prevented from entering it. So we have this phase transition in, in which this um, acts like um, a region that cannot be uh, entered. Um, so this, uh, the previous example was in case of homogeneous graph, so uh, a simple one, but we can uh, um, consider uh, more generic situations in which uh, the graph um, is completely generic. And so the spins attached to the edges um, are completely generic. We still uh, find uh, um, an area law because, um, as I said, the, the, the edge degrees of freedom are directly related to the area. So whenever we cut, uh, we have a contribution to the entropy proportional to the area. Uh, we can consider uh, um, we consider a particular uh, geometry that is interesting in cosmology because uh, it has a spherical symmetry. And we consider spins that uh, increases with the radius. Um, and again, the spins are related to the area. So we want them to increase with the radius. And we can recover uh, a similar behavior, what we have seen before with the emergence of these regions uh, um, um, in which the surface, um, the minimum area surface cannot enter. So in this case, we see that, uh, so if we don't consider entanglement of the bulk degrees of freedom, then we just have the usual um, area law. And uh, indeed uh, the surface tries to minimize the area. So we have a surface that drop from uh, a shell of higher radius to a shell of smaller radius. But once we, um, we uh, excite correlations among the uh, intertwiner degrees of freedom, what we see is that the surface um, is prevented from entering this um, region in which the intertwiners are highly entangled to each other. Um, okay, let me, uh, so in the last, 
Um, 10 minutes, I, I, I just uh, give you a very short uh, overview of the second, uh, uh, the second research direction um, that has been explored. Uh, in this, um, in the context of uh, this analogy between group field theory and tensor networks. Um, so we have seen how uh, to study the way in which the boundary entropy is related to the bulk, but a different question is how the information um, from the bulk is um, transported to the boundary. And uh, in particular, um, what we can do is to consider our spin network graph and uh, look at and consider it as a map from the bulk degrees of freedom to the boundary degrees of freedom. This is something that is, um, is very um, common in tensor networks uh, in the sense that the, the tensor itself can be seen either as a state uh, if every, um, if all um, indices are output indices, or as a map, if you consider a subset of the indices as an input space and the complementary part as output. Now we use the same uh, idea here, and we just look at the bulk degrees of freedom as input degrees of freedom and the output ones, the boundary ones as output. Um, degrees of freedom. And so we want to study a map that um, uh, given some uh, correlations for the bulk degrees of freedom, uh, transport this information to the boundary. And so we want to see the uh, resulting boundary state uh, obtained by feeding the graph with certain bulk um, correlations. So here we have uh, our bulk input state for the intertwiners giving on the vertices. And here we have the output boundary states, which the state, which is a state for these boundary edges resulting from inserting these correlations in the bulk. Um, so uh, this is studied with the, um, the map state duality of information theory, also called uh, the choi jamilkowski theory. Um, and so um, here, uh, the, the, the main point of this back to boundary map uh, is that you can translate from the um, properties of your map to the property of a state. So instead of studying the property of the map, which is something um, uh, that might be challenging, you can just look at the property of the state, uh, which is dual to your map. Uh, so we use the same technique here, uh, and uh, uh, this corresponds to taking two copies of the bulk, apply your map that moves from the bulk to the boundary, and look at the resulting state. And uh, you can check that the conditions for the bulk to boundary map to be an isometry is equivalent to that of the reduced bulk state to be maximally mixed. So you can just check that your bulk to boundary map is an isometry by computing uh, the Rennie entropy uh, or the von Neumann entropy of your bulk state and check if the entropy is maximized. And uh, um, so this is just a brief overview. You can do exactly the same. Uh, you can apply exactly the same technique that I, I illustrated before um, mapping the uh, entropy computation to the evaluation of a free energy in a Ising model. And uh, what has been uh, found is that the isometric uh, um, character of these back to boundary maps for a spin network uh, increases uh, um, with the inhomogeneity of the spins on the edges. So more inhomogeneous is the graph and more holographic is the map. In particular, uh, if the graph is completely homogeneous, then you cannot have an isometry. And this is mainly due to the 
um, balance between the dimension of the bulk and the dimension of the boundary. Uh, this can be, of course, generalized to uh, considering complementary regions of the boundaries instead of bulk and boundary to superposition of spins. And these are two um, directions that you can already uh, find that has been explored. But there is, of course, much more to, to see, in particular at the level of uh, superposition of graphs of different uh, network geometries, which is the interesting case for uh, quantum gravity, of course. Um, okay, I, I close here with some references in which you can find um, for foundations of group field theory. These are, of course, just a small subset of uh, many, many uh, papers you find on the topic, but uh, these three, in my view, are particularly uh, clear and useful. Um, for the second part, in which instead uh, in the relationship to tensor network is explored, uh, this first is a review in which you can find many more references. Um, and then these are more specific to uh, the dictionary with tensor networks and the, the investigation of the holographic behavior. And uh, this is all what I had. Thank you for, for the attention. Thank you very much for your nice talk.